Hello and welcome to this talk which is the first in a series about carbon pricing. Here I'll give a brief overview of how carbon pricing works. So what do we mean by carbon pricing? Carbon pricing means that sources of emissions such as power plants, vehicles, factories and homes have to pay a price for each tonne of carbon dioxide and sometimes other greenhouse gases that they put into the atmosphere. Exactly how this is done doesn't matter for now. The price might be in the form of a tax, or it might be in the form of a requirement to buy tradable certificates, usually called allowances, under an emissions trading system. Under this type of system, one allowance must be purchased to cover each tonne of emissions, and the cost of buying the allowance is the carbon price. I'll cover these in my next talk, but as I say, for now, what matters is that a price must be paid for each tonne of emissions. The fundamental idea is that putting a price on emissions creates a direct financial incentive to reduce them, and so reduce climate change. So how does this work? Let's look at the example of an electricity system with both gas and coal fuel generating plants, a very common situation around the world. To meet demand for electricity, we have a choice of which plant to use, so which plant generates the electricity. If we look at the cost of producing a unit of electricity, which is measured here in dollars per megawatt hour, simply based on fuel and other operating costs, it will often be the case that it will be cheaper to run coal plant than gas plant. These costs are shown here by the height of the grey bars. The data here is illustrative, but it's fairly realistic. However, coal-fuelled power plants emit more carbon dioxide for each unit of electricity produced than gas-fuelled power plants. This is mainly because coal is an intrinsically higher emitting fuel and creates nearly twice as much carbon dioxide per unit of energy as does gas. It is also because gas-fuelled plants are usually more efficient than coal-fuelled plants. Each unit of electricity made using gas requires less energy in. Put these two effects together and you get coal plant emitting maybe two to two and a half times as much carbon dioxide as a gas plant for each unit of electricity produced, though this varies somewhat with which plants we're talking about. So, if we put in a carbon price, both plants must pay a price for every tonne they emit. The increase in cost for the coal plant is much greater than for the gas plant because its emissions are so much greater. This is shown by the green bars on the chart. If it emits two and a half times as much, then the cost of the emissions will be two and a half times as great. Instead of being cheaper to run the coal plant, it is now more expensive. The gas plant will run instead of coal plant and emissions will be reduced by around 50 to 60%. The total cost of generating electricity increases and this will typically feed through to prices to households and businesses. This may reduce electricity use as a result, leading to a further reduction in emissions. But this effect will usually be much smaller than the effect of switching fuels. There are many other examples of carbon pricing working in similar ways. Indeed, one of the advantages of carbon pricing is that it can create incentives over many different types of emissions. For example, when making an investment in industrial production, a carbon price will help create incentives to install more efficient technology with lower emissions. Similarly, although gas plants have lower emissions than coal plants, they have higher emissions than renewables such as wind power, which emit nothing from generation. So there will be an incentive to build new wind plant rather than new gas plant. So that's the idea. Does it work in practice? The answer is yes if carbon prices are set at high enough levels. The effectiveness of carbon pricing has been clearly shown in the UK over the last few years. The carbon price for power generation in the UK is made up of two components. The first is the cost of buying allowances under the EU's emissions trading system, shown here by the grey bars on the chart. However, these prices have been too low to reduce emissions very much on their own. The second component is the UK's own carbon tax for the power sector, called carbon price support, which is shown by the green bars. This has increased a lot in recent years, increasing the total carbon price. This has in turn led to a very rapid fall in generation from coal, which has mainly been replaced by gas in almost exactly the way I've already described. Emissions from coal generation have fallen by about 90% in the last five years, shown by the black line on the chart. The net fall in emissions is less than this, just over 50% if you take account of the emissions from running gas plant instead. This is shown by the dashed blue line on the chart. Not all of this fall has been due to the carbon price. Some coal plants were due to close anyway, for example. However, 
About 75% of this fall, about 45 million tonnes, is attributable to the carbon price. This is more than 10% of total UK emissions. Carbon pricing has thus been highly effective at reducing emissions. However, many carbon prices around the world are too low to lead to such changes in behaviour. In other European countries, which do not have the additional carbon price, coal plant has continued to run much more than in the UK. Because of its potential to reduce emissions cost effectively, carbon pricing has become quite widespread around the world over the past two decades. Here's a chart from the World Bank that illustrates this, showing where and when new carbon pricing schemes have been introduced. The vertical axis shows the proportion of total global emissions priced. You can see carbon pricing has grown from just a few small systems in Europe back in the early 2000s to many jurisdictions in almost every region of the world. It has spread all over Europe, to many parts of North America, increasingly to parts of South America as well, and to major economies in Asia, notably in Korea and several regions in China. However, the definition of carbon pricing adopted for this chart is rather broad, and some of the systems produce very low prices, or in one or two cases, none at all, and several of them produce prices too low to have much of an effect. While this spread of carbon pricing is welcome, carbon prices in practice are generally too low to be fully effective. If we look at this chart, again from the World Bank, showing carbon prices around the world, we can see that many are below $10 a tonne and most are below $20. This is well below where they need to be to do the job they should be doing. An expert panel looked at a range of indicators and concluded that prices need to be in the range $40 to $80 per tonne. Many modelling studies show similar levels. And if you look at the social cost of carbon, the cost of damages caused by emissions, that is also likely within this range or even higher. However, the UK price has been somewhat below these levels and still been highly effective, so these are not invariable rules. These markers nevertheless all imply that carbon prices need to be raised substantially over time to become more effective, and there are indications that this is happening in a range of jurisdictions. But is carbon pricing a good idea anyway? Not everyone agrees that it is. Perhaps the most frequent argument against carbon pricing is that it will damage economic competitiveness by increasing cost to industry. In fact, carbon pricing has very little effect on the competitiveness of most of the economy. There is a risk in a few sectors where emissions are high, so carbon pricing can lead to a large increase in costs, and companies face international competition. Here, most carbon pricing systems have explicit mechanisms to guard against damaging competitiveness. So this really is not a valid objection to carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is also sometimes said to be too expensive for households, or at least socially regressive, because it hits poor consumers hardest. However, this can be addressed by using revenue raised from carbon pricing to protect vulnerable consumers. Some are suspicious that carbon pricing is just another way for governments to raise revenue. But in many respects, carbon pricing is a good way of raising revenue because it can create an incentive to avoid something, namely emissions, that we wish to discourage, while using the revenue to reduce taxes on other things we wish to encourage, like income or value added. There is no reason why carbon pricing should increase total tax revenue. For example, in British Columbia, the carbon tax is revenue neutral, with revenue raised balanced by reductions in other taxes, notably income taxes. Another objection is that carbon pricing precludes the use of other policy instruments such as efficiency standards or subsidies for new technologies. However, such policies can and do run alongside carbon pricing. It is also sometimes said that although fine in theory, it doesn't work in practice and that prices are too low to be fully effective. However, a price of say $15 per tonne while too low is better than zero, and prices too low is a reason for making prices higher, not abolishing them completely. Finally, some have ethical objections to, as they see it, commoditizing or selling nature, extending markets to where they don't belong. It's true that the overall objectives for emissions reductions must be decided by ethical considerations. However, this does not preclude the use of carbon pricing as a tool for helping get to these objectives, and it is surely better to price nature than to give it away free to polluters. My own view is that objections to carbon pricing can all be addressed by appropriate design, Indeed, there is now increasing evidence that acceptance of carbon pricing increases as it is introduced and people see the benefits. 
So, in summary, carbon pricing creates financial incentives to reduce emissions. It is increasingly widespread around the world. It can be effective if prices are at adequate levels, but in many cases they are too low at present. And there are some potential obstacles that need to be addressed by careful design. I'll pick up on many of the issues raised here in subsequent talks. Thanks for watching. Further details, including a transcript of this talk and accompanying slides, are available on my website www.onclimatechangepolicy.org.